I'd knew that, I'd got my hair done. Whenever you guys are ready. <clears throat> Give me just one second. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. I know it's pretty cold outside. Today we're going to talk about seeking justice in an unjust world. The point of this lesson is to join God in pursuing justice in the face of indifference and oppression. And before we begin the lesson, Kirby, would you pray for us this morning? Amen. Thank you, Kirby. We're going to talk about the Edomites this morning. And these are blood brothers of the Israelites. The Edomites are descendants of Esau. And we remember uh, in the book of Genesis, Jacob and Esau were born. And there was a rivalry between them that went throughout their lives. And even the, their descendants uh, were at odds with each other throughout the scriptures. No, no one would deny that injustice occurs in our society and that people experience oppression, even violence. But how should we respond to the tragic and unjust events in the lives of, let's say, the unborn, the aged, the disabled, and those of different racial or ethnic backgrounds? This is a question that many Christians have yet to answer. God sees the plight of the oppressed and acts on their behalf, and he calls us to do the same. <clears throat> we must get away from being too comfortable. We are all in this church greatly blessed with uh, material things. Most of us are, are in good health. It's very easy to come, worship on Sunday, go back to our little comfort zone and not give anybody else another thought. God doesn't want us to do that. We are to partner with him and help plead the cause of those that are oppressed, of the widowed and the fatherless, people that we see that are suffering from injustice. We should try to help them. Most recently, a ministry that's on hold right now was the feeding of the homeless over here on Leffel Lane that we participated in. Doing acts of service like that for people that are less fortunate. Now the problem with the Edomites 
They were prideful. They were arrogant. They believed themselves to be self-sufficient. And that's the attitude sometimes of people today in, in our society. They have a big bank account. They have a lofty position somewhere. They live somewhere where they're untouchable of the society's problems and things that go on. So they uh, have no concern for injustice because it's not affecting them. The prophet Obadiah is the author. No biographical information is provided about him in the book other than him being a prophet. Obadiah's message is directed toward the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, and to all the nations. During the invasion of the Babylonians into the land of Judah, Edom used God's act of judgment to get revenge on God's people. In response, God rebuked and pronounced judgment on Edom and other nations. Edom stood by as Babylon carried Israel or Judah away captive and even cut off any escape routes for people that were trying to flee. The purpose of the book of Obadiah is to show that God judges those who have harmed his people. The author is Obadiah, and his name translates servant or worshiper. Hi, Gordon. Glad to see you, buddy. You feeling good? Good. There's two possible dates that this book of Obadiah was written and I'm not going to elaborate on that this morning. You can research that yourself. I want to get to some more important points uh, in the book. Historically, Edom had constantly harassed the Jews. Prior to the time this book was written, they had participated in attacks against Judah. Given the dates above, this prophecy came after the division of Israel into the northern and southern kingdoms and before the conquering of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. The key verse in this uh, book, and it's only one chapter, is verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. The key people here is the message to the Edomites. The book of Obadiah shows the outcome of the ancient feud between Edom and Israel. Edom was proud of its high position, but God would bring her down. Those who are high and powerful today should not be overconfident in themselves, whether they are a nation, a corporation, a church, or a family. Just as Edom was destroyed for its pride, so will anyone who lives in defiance of God. Do you have a prideful attitude this morning? Let's hope that we don't. Because this type of pride and arrogance leads to spiritual blindness. We lose track of God's sovereignty over things. We're misled, misled into thinking that we've got everything under control and that nothing can come against us or us have any problems, which is just the opposite. We know this morning that God is sovereign and he can bring your world to a crashing flat in a moment's time. 
It can be a phone call. It can be any number of things. Your, your life can be turned upside down. So we must remain humble. Don't gloat in someone's misfortune. Even though they may deserve what they get or what's coming to them, God's children are not to take pleasure in someone's misfortune or suffering. We are to love them and support them. So that, that's a mistake, too, that people often will see a situation and, boy, he got what he deserved, didn't he? And we'll be all pumped up, but God doesn't want us to be like that. Obadiah predicted that God would destroy Edom as punishment for standing by when Babylon invaded Judah. Because of their treachery, Edom's land would be given to Judah in the day when God rights the wrongs against his people. God will, punish, will judge and fairly, fiercely punish all who harm his people. We can be confident in God's final victory. He is our champion, and we can trust him to bring about true justice. Because of their seemingly invincible rock fortress, the Edomites were proud and self-confident, but God humbled them and their nation disappeared from the face of the earth. All those who defy God will meet their doom as Edom did. Any nation who trusts in its power, wealth, technology, or wisdom more than in God will be brought low. All who are proud will one day be shocked to discover that no one is exempt from God's justice. God's hand is not shortened this morning and don't be misled into thinking well nobody will see that nobody will know what I'm doing or not doing God knows all and sees all and we know that his judgment is going to be meticulous and it will be done in truth let's go ahead and read some verses Kenny you want to read I see you're ready Obadiah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. pretty powerful so there's no room for any sense of pride among anybody for the Lord can bring you down let's uh, talk about these verses here for a minute and we'll read uh, some more here in a second the book begins with the inscription the vision of Obadiah and vision here refers to a supernatural revelation from the Lord. Obadiah received a vision from the Lord that painted a picture of future events. The Lord announced a message to the nations 
let us rise up against her, referring to the nation of Edom. The Lord was going to use other nations to bring judgment against Edom. God in his sovereignty can use whatever or whomsoever he pleases to do his bidding and to do his will. The Lord was forming a coalition against the Edomites since Edom was part of an alliance against the Israelites. Edom was in a ter terrible predicament. The nation had violated God's word and should have dreaded God's impending judgment. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. He's warning them with that. Other nations would disregard them, seeing them as worthless. And that's talked about in Jeremiah in chapter 49. This passage foretells the severe judgment that would come upon Edom on account of its arrogance and opposition to God's people. Edom would be diminished to the point that the nation would be considered small. Moreover, it would be greatly despised. Israel's enemy would face its own judgment from God and the other nations. Edom was south, east, I believe, of Judah. And it was a fortress. It was carved out of a rock. And the only way to get into it was a narrow passage. It was a plateau, as I read, which a plateau is a mountainous region, which is flat on the top. And this is where they had built... Uh, Petra was their capital. On the other side of the plateau was an area of deep ravines and valleys and uh, cliffs. So access was only through this one passageway. The Edomites were strong people. They were actually stronger than Judah. They were fierce and they were much like Esau. Now, when I read this, we see the animosity between the people of Judah and the, the Israelites and Edom was ongoing for centuries. When Israel first wanted to go into the promised land, Edom forbade them to cut through, and they had to go around to, to go in. What st stuck out to me in this, all these generations, the Edomites hated the Jews. Where did they get that notion? It was passed down from every succeeding generation. This is how you this is to be your attitude towards these people. They were actually blood brothers, cousins. Now Jacob and Esau did reconcile for a short period, but the relatives never did reconcile. How many people today, let's just say the good old boys, that still have prejudice, in their hearts against black people, against any other ethnicity other than uh, the Aryan race. It's been passed down. And that string needs to be broken. People need to start hearing the truth, taking their children to church, and they themselves hearing the word of God and allowing God's word to change their hearts and their way of thinking. It's, it's as if, well, that's the way we've always done it. Things are no different now. I, I hate them people because mommy and daddy hated them, and that's what I've learned. We need to break that, that chain 
or that cycle, so to speak. Edom was condemned for its passive disobedience and self-preservation. Are we kind of self-preservationists? Someday we are. Hey, as long as I'm good, I'm good. I'm not too worried about some guy over here digging in the dumpster. I got the heater on in the car. I just left McDonald's. Life's good. We need to be concerned about these people that are less fortunate and that God puts in our path. And this is exactly what Edom did. They were, their acts were called violence against the Jewish people. And God was going to call them out on it. God had seen enough, had enough, and he brought them down. Edom thought they were invincible. And many people today think they're invincible. That I've got everything going on. I'm, I'm living good. Nothing's broke down right now. We have to have a heart for those that are less fortunate. And Edom did not. Their arrogance blinded them from seeing themselves as God saw them, from seeing the injustice around them, and from seeing the holiness of God, which kept them from fearing the Lord. We should be so thankful for Jesus coming and dying for us on the cross. How, how in the world could we be prideful about anything? We should have hearts of humility and ever thankful and live as God would want us to live, to reach out and, and help those that we see in need. Think about the story of the Good Samaritan. Who stopped and helped him? It wasn't the priest or the other fellow. I can't remember who it was in that story but it was the least likely of who you would expect to stop. Help the, help the gentleman that was beaten and robbed. Go ahead, Jim. That, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, the least likely of, of someone to come to their assistance. <clears throat> we think about injustice today. What about all the abortions that are being allowed? And I'm not getting political here, but if someone is running for an office and they support abortion, probably shouldn't be voting for him. Absolutely should not be voting for him. And I'm not trying to sugarcoat that. But there, there's a, a form of injustice. Amen. And to go ahead and not declare that a person denies them all basic constitutional protection. But well, we've gotten so cramped in this nation that once a child is born, and say that, you know, is it an abortion defense that the child is born alive, he was a child. It's despicable. It's absolutely despicable. Yeah. Terry. No way to sugarcoat the truth. That's right. It's not right. There's no way to sugarcoat it. No. That's why you can't go to somebody for that that supports it. Absolutely not. 
any blessing or good thing that we experience can lead us to arrogantly think we are stronger, smarter, or more deserving of good gifts than those around us. We need to see all that we possess as a gift that we can steward for the good of others and for the growth of the kingdom. We must choose whether we will act like the people of Edom or act like Christ. What in the world would we have to boast about? That if we boast in anything, we boast in Christ and what he's done for us. An arrogant attitude deceives us and keeps us from seeing reality. In these next verses, we see that the sin of indifference leads to violence and oppression. Would someone like to read some more verses? The Edomites were so bodacious that they cut off any way of escape when the Babylonians came to uh, conquer uh, Judah and take them away captive. They cut off the escape routes and they also aided the Babylonians in turning in people that were trying to escape. That's... uh, That's unspeakable. In the violence done to your brother Jacob, they reveled in Israel's destruction. Violence here, the noun for violence, is overt physical viciousness. And that's talked about again, too, in the book of Amos and in the book of Habakkuk. When I read uh, and studied this book of Obadiah, the book of Amos is right next to it. It's like seven chapters. It, it talks a lot about this too. And there's a mention of Edom in that book and the judgment that was coming to them. It made uh, for some support reading for the book of Obadiah. Judgment from Yahweh was twofold in this passage. Yahweh told the Edomites that they will be covered with shame. Shame is con- to convey divine punishment and destroyed forever at the hand of Yahweh to describe being cut off carries with it the connotation of absolute termination. In verses 12 through 14, the prophet hammered the Edomites with a series of eight negatives, do not, that reflect and clarify the eight descriptions of the day of Judah's calamity. 
do not gloat over your brother in the day of his calamity. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction. Do not boastfully mock in the day of distress. These are commandments for us, too. Don't gloat over somebody's misfortune. That's just, use an example. There's a known drug house over here, and the place burns down. Well, we're glad it's gone. But what about the people that lived in there? Maybe there were children in there. Don't uh, gloat for that reason. Do not enter my people's city gate in the day of their disaster. How many recent tragedies and the most recent is the tornado that took a 200 mile swat through Kentucky. The devastation that was there the National Guard is called out to help. And what was one of the problems? Looting. People going around and scavenging and picking up whatever they could. That's unspeakable. Do not gloat over their misery in the day of their disaster. Do not appropriate their possessions in the day of their disaster. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off their fugitives and do not hand over their survivors in the day of distress. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction. Do not boastfully mock in the day of distress. Judgment is coming on them because they violated their relationship of their kin. That was their family. They should have been coming to Judah's aid and assistance and standing with them against the Babylonians. And they sided with the Babylonians and aided them. And God took note of it. Not only was their behavior immoral and inhuman, but it was also sacrilege. As Judah's kin, the Edomites should have known Judah was Yahweh's own possession. Edom's passion should have been roused in anger for their brother's defilement. Instead, their greed and lust drove them to participate in the wickedness of the Babylonians. Judgment is warranted because their lust for vengeance turned into participation of the sacking of Jerusalem. Not all of society is included in the body of Christ. Still, none of us have room or reason to gloat or participate in the misfortune of others. When asked about one's neighbor, Christ described how supposedly religious persons had treated the wounded Samaritan. We are to treat our neighbors as ourselves, regardless of their relationship to Christ. We should have empathy towards anyone whether they're saved or not, whether they're a drug addict, an alcoholic, if they're homeless and come up and ask you for a couple of dollars, if you have it, give to them. Because what did, what did Jesus say that when you've done it to the least of one of these, you've done it unto me. Notice in the passages above that the sin of indifference leads to violence and oppression. Edom's progression in their actions moved from standing aloof to gloating, which led to take advantage, taking advantage 
of their brothers. Did we read all the verses? Let's go ahead and read some more verses. I talk too much. In response for the egregious, egregious actions of the Edomites, the prophet said, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. The day of the Lord has a few different meanings depending on the context. First, the expression was used to announce the Lord's judgment on the nation of Israel for its failure to love God and love its neighbors. Second, the prophets used this phrase to announce God's deliverance of his people from their oppressors. Third, it can be used in reference to God's judgment on foreign nations. And fourth, the phrase can also be used to specify the nation that God is going to judge. For instance, Isaiah 9.4 refers to the day of Midian as a time when God would break the yoke of oppression from the shoulders of his people. God promised he would bring his justice on the Edomites and all the nations soon. No one will escape his righteous judgment in the book of Revelation that it talks about that men will cry out for the rocks to fall upon them and hide them from Jesus. Saints can participate in divine retribution by praying for God to repay men and women according to their works. And that's in Psalms 28, 4. Also, Christians can open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Proverbs 31, verse 8 and 9. We are right now, on a personal note, everyone knows that Penny had passed. She has a bunch of clothes. And we're getting in order, moving towards getting these bagged up and taken to St. Vincent de Paul, probably. But that someone else will get some use out of the this clothing and uh, sister Jerry is going to be a recipient of some because her and Penny were built a lot alike but I think it's better to do that than to throw them in the dumpster Amen. let someone get some use out of this it's all good stuff it's clean so Maybe someone else can get a blessing uh, from that. Obadiah pronounced that God's judgment was coming to Edom. But we also see a shift in verb tense here, an indicator that Edom's downfall was being used as an image or foreshadowing of the fall of the nations that act in this way. 
The day of the Lord is near, and the Lord will judge all the heathen. Not just some of them. Not just Russia. Not just China. Not just some of those countries in Africa that practice terrorism and uh, dictators there. All the heathens. I don't see any being left out. And the Lord will judge all the heathen that act like Edom acted towards Judah. And not only will God bring judgment on Edom, but he will also restore Judah. Many of us in here have children. When we raised them, we took care of them. We fed them, we nurtured them, we protected them, we looked out for them. God has children too. And God is going to look out for his children. He's going to protect them and nurture them and look out for them. God too has children. Men and women who, whom he has chosen as his very own. There have always been individuals marked as his. But with Abraham, he promised to build a nation. Israel was to be God's country and her people, the Jews, his very own sons and daughters. Down through the centuries, God meted out discipline and punishment, but always with love and mercy. God still meets out punishment and judgment on his children, and chastisement, as it's called. But God, the eternal Father, protected and cared for his children. If he wants to render judgment or discipline on you, so be it, but just him alone, and not other countries, unless he is using another people to render that judgment. Today, God's holy nation is his church. All who have trusted Christ for their salvation and have given their lives to him. These men and women are God's born again and adopted children. As you read Obadiah, catch a glimpse of what it means to be God's child under his love and protection. See how the heavenly father responds to all who would attack, excuse me, those whom he loves. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the Lord, and he will plead our cause against those that oppress and, and mistreat us. It is our duty, our responsibility, and the highest privilege to proclaim the kingdom of God here on earth. But we live in a sinful world that is bent towards sin and brokenness and destruction. We must use what we've been given for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of our neighbors, for the sake of the forgotten, and for the sake of the unborn. We must fight indifference and passivity and press into the work of doing justice, loving through mercy, and extending that love holistically to our neighbors from the womb to the tomb. Then and only then can we follow in the footsteps of our Savior who made it clear to us what he came to do. There's a thing in your lesson book, and I'll, I'll stop here in a second. It talks about how you might be particularly blessed. What about free time or money? Clothing, as I mentioned. Creative talents. 
housing, family, church, social network, food. What are some ways you could use the blessings you circled to help the oppressed in your community? There's all kinds of ways that we can help if we'd just be willing to, to do so. I thank you for your patience with me. And we'll start a new session, section next week in the book of Genesis. Thank you so much.